Welcome to the last session. You made it. All right. All right. You can't, you can't let up your energy. It's just uh, it's getting good. Um, so it's my honor to be the moderator of this final panel of the event with um, some amazing people. Um, in just five years, Pitt UN has brought vital energy and attention to the ways that technology is taught, developed, and governed across academia, industry, government, and civil society. In this, our closing panel, three esteemed Pitt leaders, one a key funder, one a university leader, and one a preeminent scholar, discuss the biggest challenges and opportunities for funders and universities as we look to solidify progress and look to future growth in the field. Through public interest technology, universities and funders have a unique opportunity to foster research, education, and career opportunities and build a vital infrastructure that leverages technology to address the biggest challenges of our time. And we have some big ones. In this fireside chat, San Jose State University President Cynthia Teniente Matson will be in conversation with esteemed scholar Safia Noble of UCLA and Darren Walker, President of the Ford Foundation, about public interest technology and the opportunities for philanthropy and higher education in this historic moment. So please join me in welcoming our guests. All right, we're going to get started with the fact, obviously, that we're here at a wonderful public university in the heart of Silicon Valley, a preeminent higher education institution. So the first question for all of us, why is and why are higher education institutions really at the forefront of the fight for technology and really thinking about how we imagine, design, and deploy technology that really serves the public interest. Cynthia, can we start with you? Certainly, well, good afternoon. And again, I'm, hope, I'm glad you've had a, a wonderful time here at our university. Our university is the oldest university on the West, so we think of ourselves as the original startup and the original influencers in the tech <laughs> community. And now we find ourselves, as you heard from uh, Russ Hancock, at the epicenter of the future. So what is the role of higher education, the role of our universities? It is in large part what it has always been about holistic student engagement. In this ever-changing context and con contextual application, we have to help students understand, help ourselves understand, help our faculty continue to evolve uh, at, with San Jose State and with education as the differentiator for how we make sense of sometimes things that may not seem as clear to us. I have been saying to students uh, in general that they are going to lead, our youth, they are going to lead a very different life than the lives that we have led because of the advent of these technologies and how they will coexist with them. But they will also be the ones responsible for shaping that future. And that is going to be based on what they learn at our institutions now, what they learned yesterday, those alumni that are out in the workforce now being that differentiator. So I think for us as a university, we have to lead in how we're teaching and helping students and people and all of us to understand our rights, our or if we want to own our origin story now with our data and how our data moves with us to better understand the richness of privacy and the integration of that uh, trade-off with the newer technologies and what that will mean for the future. And here at San Jose State, we're also a very vital anchor institution in a large urban setting. So we also have to think about our role with partners because no one has enough resources to do this alone. And we heard that earlier in one of the, the inquiries about 
How do, you, how do you build the computing power so we can run all these models that we're expecting students to learn? These are some of the challenges that are before us. So as our university, we have recently reorganized, the provost talked about this in, in the earlier panel with the new college, new college of information, data, and society to think about the translational approaches, the transdisciplinary approaches, the interdisciplinary approaches to how we're going to think about preparing students for that. While we wrestle with the intersection, and I think Vin gave the great example of engineers, we produce a lot of engineers at San yeah. Jose State <laughs> that are fueling the technology industry, but their curriculum is very tight. So there's, we have to think about that integration of all of these other learning disciplines so that they're prepared in the in the industry when they're there. And I'll, I'll end on this point, Charlton. Um, about a month ago, we hosted Georgetown University Free Speech Project right here on our campus, actually in this building on the other, in one of our theaters. There was a very interesting conversation relative to free speech and free expression mm. that is influenced by algorithms. And one of the speakers and one of the presenters was a CTO at one of the major um, entities and was giving a under the hood tour in conversation about how the who's making the decisions and how the decisions are being made by people like us sitting on the stage, um, three or four people in a room, determining what they're going to do based on the algorithm influences and how that is going to influence all of their technologies in their particular companies. So it's very empowering for us to think about who are those individuals how are they trained, and what is in their thought process. And for us being a very diverse institution, it gives us a real opportunity to lean in and lead in some of those uh, spaces because we're training individuals now for that second and third and fourth job to meet those demanding challenges in the entire infrastructure that is being uh, altered through uh, artificial intelligence and the convergence of lots of technologies. And can Amazing. I just on this point, because Cynthia is not going to take the props that uh, she <laughs> deserves because let's just acknowledge that this is a public university. Right. That the idea and the connection, both of you are from two great public universities and the role in a democracy of public institutions and the ways in which in a period of seeming growing authoritarianism, institutions that are our public institutions are at risk. And so the work that you are doing is that much more important. I have never had a day of private education in my life. I went to Head Start, public schools, a public college, a public law school. I rarely am on a panel when every panelist can say that. Yeah. <clears throat> because today, in a, in a society where there is growing inequality, elites tend to go to private institutions. That's actually bad for our democracy. And so the role that your institutions are playing, not only to level set and to in an increasingly diverse society, America, produce future leaders. The fact that you're doing this in the technology space is even more critical. Well, especially now, you're right, uh, Darren, I listened to one of your podcasts that you gave about uh, public interest technology, and I appreciate that prompt because as a public institution, we are the public, and our students are students that in some cases come from a public high school to a public community college that come to us. They bring their as-lived experiences in a different way than we might find in other settings that is going to be so critical in our democracy, but in this case, in technology and what technology will mean for democracy. Darren, if I might um, continue this, this thread about the importance of higher education and just ask you a little bit about you know when we heard a story earlier about uh, the initial note that suggested we needed to build a public interest technology ecosystem. Um, what was it for you? How did you see it being important as a funder to say universities are where we need to invest 
to do this work? What compelled you to say, this is where that needs to happen, rather than say, building that within a, uh, a tech hub like Silicon Valley where we're in, why universities? Well, because universities have been the platforms for social change and progress in our democracy. So particularly in the last 50 to 75 years, right? Silicon Valley wouldn't exist if there hadn't been a commitment by the government to invest in building out the, the technology, uh, an economic platform in the 1950s as America thought about its place in the world. And so universities are the platform. The, and so it was an easy, that, that wasn't hard. Mm. The question was, which universities? Mm. So, you know, and in, in full transparency, you know, when the Ford Foundation did the public interest law work, that was right. mostly, that was, Berkeley was one of the few publics, right? And, and so we intentionally said this had to be diverse. Mm -hmm. We would go to HBCUs, historically Hispanic serving, et cetera, that the, that the community that would be initially constructed would acknowledge the centrality of those institutions to producing for our democracy the leaders in technology. And so it wasn't right. like hard. Yeah. It wasn't hard <laughs> at all. Indeed. Safia. I have a lot of thoughts on a lot of things. I'm going to try to say it to, all. Say it all. I'm going to, well, I, I will say that one of the challenges to me about thinking about this idea of public interest technology and the university in particular is that you're absolutely right. The universities, I mean, UCLA was one of the first nodes on the internet. The R&D labs are in the universities. What's missing often is not that we all understand the incredible importance of, of public goods and resourcing the public and resourcing democracy and resourcing res racial justice and civil rights and human rights. It's that um, our, sometimes our power analysis to how we got here to this moment where we are kind of resource depleted, where we're dependent upon philanthropy to fill the gap, why we don't understand, the students don't understand, why we don't have computing at the university anymore, is because we've in fact been the site of complete excavation and extraction by this very corridor, Silicon Valley corridor, and Silicon corridors all over the world. So what we have is public institutions that have been completely grifted quite frankly, by industry, where they have, for example, used uh, National Science Foundation money uh, and university labs to outsource the riskiest, most dangerous dimensions of their development, which is funded by the taxpayers, and um, where they beta test their dangerous products on our communities, in fact, with no oversight, no regulation, to work out whatever might happen, and of course what we know, some of the things that happen are the collapses of Western liberal democracies around the world. That's like one uh, outcome of some of the beta testing mm -hmm. of products like social media. And we have uh, um, legislatures that don't have resources to put back into the public goods, the public universities, where we could do the innovation, because those very companies, those very, that very industry, the tech industry, doesn't pay taxes. They offshore their profits. They put nothing back into the coffers. They take the very best students, they, they, they take the cream of the crop, and those people then are not available to go and work back into the public goods. I am a product of these public goods too, like you, Darren. I, what, I was a student at the, in the CSU system 
I got my bachelor's degree at Fresno State. I went to San Jose State for graduate school. I studied sociology in Dudley Moore Hall, like steps away from here. I read Foucault there. And, you know, it trained me. These places trained me to be the scholar that I am and also at the public university at the University of Illinois. And so I think we have to not perceive that we are in the, the position of, oh, this is something new, that de technology development, caring about the public good, that is not new to the university, as you, as you said. It's actually core to the public good and educating the public is core to the mission of public education, public universities. What is different over the last 50 years has been the um, complete capture of public resources and the massive wealth transfers that have happened out of our universities, out of our schools, our libraries, uh, you know, we could name many, many different kinds of public goods. And then, and then we wake up one day and we say, how did we get here? Well, you know, how we got here is that there has been a very deliberate power grab on the behalf of the tech industry and um, we can see that. You could turn on CNN this morning and see Elon like this on the stage at the rallies, all right, um, um, uh, along with many other tech leaders. So I think we have, we are actually at a state of heightened crisis. This is heightened crisis. If this week is not the crisis moment that puts it all on display, we need to understand how we are here now. Now we cannot be in a position of saying like, what we need is like a grant to the university and how come we don't have like, you know, infrastructure? Well, you know, in the University of California, the reason we don't have computing infrastructure is because we outsourced it to Google about 10 years ago. Mm. And so now all the millions of dollars that we need for computing that we could be teaching our students who come in on how to maintain hardware, how to build infrastructure, how to build networks. We used to do that in the 90s, y'all in the CSU and in the UC systems and the community college system. We don't do that now because, um, as the provost mentioned in the uh, earlier session, he gets six emails a day from salespeople. That's why. Because we are a site of profiteering. And I think that it's an incredible moment right now for us to, we might be sad, but we need to actually get energized and get super clear on what is happening and what is going to accelerate if we don't get uh, really organized and resist this continued um, uh, circling of the drain of our public goods. And you know, Darren has done incredible work with the other funders to, um, to help us hold the light of imagination that these things can still exist. I mean, these ideas about the public good and public interest technology, public resources and universities has not completely dimmed and so we need philanthropy philanthropy to play a role but we also need to put like we need to we need a massive accelerant we need to get our money organized our resources organized our funders organized our leaders organized so that we can figure out how we're going to make it through the next four years and then also bring about a whole different set of possibilities when the bottom falls out but I think, the, I think you're absolutely right in the context of this conversation and in the context of the larger issue of the public. There has been a deliberate multi-decade attempt to degrade the idea of the public. Public housing, public schools, public parks, public universities, that there has been a deliberate attempt to undermine, which is so harmful because when that degradation happens, the citizenry begins to believe that those institutions are purposely not serving them. And so it is no surprise that at some point the citizenry will step back and let others destroy those institutions. 
I mean, I think you're right. I think we know that this is a backlash to the civil rights movement. This is a backlash to uh, President Obama. I mean, we could put many different markers in place to see what the backlash and the, the, the hard lean into neoliberal economic and social policy has been. Uh, the move and the gestures toward privatization and people believing, uh, you know, my students today at UCLA, they can't believe that we used to have dance classes in public school mm. and arts and all kinds of cool things that now their parents have had to pay for them and train them in as private people, as private families. They find that hard to believe. There are lots of things that us Gen Xers, we still remember. We're like the last generation that remembers right. real public goods. Right. In, in, and the, and the, that has also been conflated with black people and our black people, Latino people, especially in, the, in California, the kind of anti-affirmative anti -affirmative action, anti-blackness, anti-Latinidad that has happened in this state in particular that has also accelerated these kind of moves around private privatization and the private um, good. But, you know, I think we have... Uh, you know, we have a lot of new ways that we can communicate what, what is happening here. And, um, you know, it'll be insufficient for us to give up on the public good, give up on racial justice and civil rights. We're gonna have to, I think, in this moment, particularly when the new administration is going to criminalize those words, criminalize those people even further, we're gonna to have to actually get smart about how to um, make these resources that we so desperately need, um, as were alluded to in the previous panel, available. Because the truth is public education is probably gonna go away in our lifetimes if we don't stop the kind of, the, the course that's flowing right now at the federal level. And um, it's, it's a moment for us to get very specific then, I think, you know, to your point. Like, w w what do we mean when we say public? What do we mean? Like, it's kind of like AI. What do we mean when we're talking about AI? What concerns me is that we're in a rush to put billions of dollars into the tech, into the tech development, into the tech, uh, like it's gonna save us. The tech is not gonna save us, y'all. The tech is no. not going to save us. We have to not just have tech informed by the humanities and social sciences, of course, that goes without saying. We also have to figure out where the tech will make our ability to, ha to, to have a sense of future be available because in the current kinds of technical models that are being foisted upon us, uh, you know, this is about collecting data from the past any given moment in our past, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and using those data from our past to forecast the future. That's what the predictive oh, models- And make decisions. To, to make decisions, but to predict. There will be no human agency if we organize our societies. There will be no moments of redemption. Every one of us, I'm sure, on this stage is here because there have been many, many moments of grace and redemption that have been afforded to all of us in this room. Imagine a future where there is no more redemption, there is no more grace, there is no more second chance, there is no more possibility, because the sophisticated model knows what's best for us. So I think we have a lot of space in the public interest technology to talk about what's in the interest of those technologies and of the interests of the public and figure out what we want to refuse and what we want to embrace. But this is the point about what has to come first, yeah. right? I mean, I think this is in the question of public interest technology, what is it in the service of? Absolutely. Or who? And, and, and who? And I how, mean, right? capital. And, and I can how. just answer that for you really quick, well, okay. capital. <laughs> and, and I think yeah, and this but. is the issue, right? I mean, this is the large issue of, 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 of our system the tension between capitalism and democracy, democracy has to win. And, and so we have, to, um, we have to have clarity uh, because without intentionality, so we will just transition all of the wrongs, bias, prejudice, as you just were describing, in the analog world, we're just gonna transfer it all over here to a new system 
that has accelerance and a velocity yeah. and a speed scale. and already. a scale that, you know, when I lived in Harlem, people would come and put uh, uh, predatory lending things under your under under your door, but that was a, that was that took three days. Now it takes one second, it takes one second yeah. and a click, and every resident in Central Harlem can get a predatory loan application within minutes, and within a week, a thousand people have signed up and are now borrowers in a predatory loan program. And the ability to predict where you should target, who you should target, and what you should charge them is a function, exactly as you say, of, a, of, a, of an AI program that predicts how many black folk in Central Harlem will actually pay 18% for a loan for their car. Let me, let me bring Cynthia back into this conversation and maybe frame it this way. Um, Safia, you, you talk a lot about we, and when we're talking about public institutions, and particularly public education and public universities, one of the reasons we're in the state that we're in is because we have not always been a part of that system that has been developing these technologies and so forth. And so we have become the problems that these technologies have been developed to solve. And we bear the disproportionate brunt of negative um, harms of technology. Cynthia, SJSU is a minority serving institution. Mm -hmm. The students that you have here represent um, the world as it really exists. Um, when we walk the corridors, uh, faces like ours are everywhere. Um, what opportunity do you see in that where there is this pipeline of folks here going directly into our, um, our, our technology ecosystem and they look like us, they bring with us the, uh, the cares, the concerns, right. the interests. Where is the opportunity as you see it being in an institution like this? You know, Sophia, I was, I was, as I was listening to you um, reflect on your observations, and, and part of this, to, to get to his question, is about the how. And I, part of what has been discussed over the yesterday and today also is the inter um, segments of education. So from R1s to R2s to comprehensive regionals to community colleges to K through 12, in this new world as you're describing it, um, where we sit today, resource constrained, we have to work much more closer together than we actually do. And those systems and structures are not in place. They're still not in place. These are these glass partitions. When we try to do this work together, um, the, the inertia of how we've been founded as institutions, public institutions nonetheless, is we're all fighting for this very limited resource and how we're going to bridge that is going to require much deeper, deeper and different thinking about the partnerships that occur across our segments. And we're not entirely set up for that. So it's based on this entrepreneurial leaders place to place. So when you think about um, minority serving institutions, it is still our job to serve all students. Although we have a majority of our students here are, are uh, from different race and ethnicities, I was looking at the numbers that I wanna share just a little bit. Our total enrollment for fall of 2023 was a little over 36,000 students. Of that, 28% of that population, 28.2 exactly, are Latinx, Latino, Latina, 32% overall from historically underserved groups. When we looked at our engineering programs, 19.2% um, of our students in the College of Engineering uh, identified as Latino or Latina. So we are making progress, and, and I could go on, I have them for all the different organizations, but engineering is one that we know has traditionally been um, underrepresented. We need to continue to do more work in this space, but we're doing the work. So to the, the point of your question, I think it comes back down to what is our role as an anchor institution? How do we create that space for the partnership to continue to do what we're supposed to be doing in the public good, teaching, research, and service? 
and in historically underserved communities and first-generation students, of which I am, I think we all are, on this stage, part of what we're able to do here at San Jose State, and I think others, you, I'm sure you're doing this work as well, but how we've been leveraging what we can do with the tech companies is ensuring that our alumni that are employed at the tech companies, many of them, again, from historically underrepresented communities or first gen or their EAGs as well, um, we're bringing our students to meet with those individuals as mentors, as sponsors, taking our students into those corporate headquarters, which they may never have an opportunity to see otherwise, and to say, this place is for you. We need you here, but we need you here to make a difference in that work. It starts from within us and makes its way up through. I mean, the data doesn't prove all that out because we see um, very low representation in blacks and Latinos in leadership roles in tech companies. So they're there. We made some inroads, but they're not persisting into the final leadership roles that we need that change to make. So there's a lot that we still need to do post, and we're talking about this. What is our responsibility as a public university once a student becomes an alumnus in helping that alumnus be successful in the next uh, career generation. Obviously, we can't do everything as a public in university, but there are some things that we know we can do well to continue to elevate that role and responsibility of a public university. Thank you. I'm gonna come back to the question that you have, or uh, something that you've all mentioned thus far, and that's about resources and thinking about the, the futures that may um, lie in front of us if we don't and aren't able to accomplish some of the goals and missions um, of uh, public interest technology, of all the things that we work for. Um, and there are, are alternatives. We have alternative visions, the possibilities of alternative futures, but those futures need funding. Safi, I'm recalling an event a few years back um, that we had uh, with some other fabulous people. And the result was someone from a tech company I, don't, I won't name, who responded and basically said, what would, it look like? what would it look like to fulfill that vision? That is to have a vision where people of color, underrepresented and marginalized folks are really truly at the center May, uh, developing, designing, profiting from these technologies. Um, and I always loved your first response, which is that number begins with a B and multiple Bs. So I'd love us to talk a little bit about the future and about funding and resources. What's needed? We've talked about the damages that have been done and that have been wrought in all of our communities. What is the scale of resources that we need to be able to even imagine undoing and creating something quite different? Well, let me just say, over the last couple of weeks, our colleague, Dr. Tamit Jabru, who many of you might know, was the Google uh, computer scientist, ethicist, who was fired from Google, and then um, a black woman, brilliant woman, who went on to start the Distributed AI Research Network. She and I, for the last couple of weeks, have been, um, Darren is gonna be so glad that I, he was not one of the people we called, but we've been jamming up um, a, a few funders, asking pointed questions, um, direct questions about what does it mean, for example, that um, this ecosystem, this room, and our colleagues are scrambling for what I would say um, someone, uh, a program officer at Ford once told me that we, we were getting, uh, as black women leaders in this space, uh, I, I made the comment that we were funded pennies on the dollar relative to not just white uh, leaders in this space, but of course, compared to the tech industry and, pe and people who on the back of an envelope get, you know, um, hundreds of millions of dollars with no plan, with a concept of a plan. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, this was our response to the fact that um, a number of philanthropists 
gave Anthropic $100 million, which um, is, you know, one of the enemies, y'all, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to uh, better say it. I mean, it's like a super problematic company. Um, I, I don't care what the marketing brochures say. And so, you know, when you, when you think about $100 million going into a company that raised $7 billion in one day, and we are here with not pennies on the dollar, but fractions of a penny on the dollar. That's the scale of what we're up to. In fact, you know, Timnit and I had very real conversations over the last couple of weeks, even before knowing the outcome of the presidential election, um, that we weren't sure how we were gonna continue to work in this field, quite frankly. We're at the point now where um, it's too painful. It's coming out of our bodies. Our bodies and our health and our families are paying for our participation now. And what we're up against are companies that have, and, and every black woman in this room is feeling this right now. I know, I know that for a fact. So I think, you know, we have to get pretty clear about if, the, if, if funders are hedging their bets by investing in the very companies that we are trying to take on who we can prove and have proven are bad actors for democracy and for our communities, but they're hedging their bets that they might make some money off of it, and then putting fractions of pennies behind black makers and thinkers, or only giving us enough resource to be critics, but not to be makers, which we are makers. We have PhDs in computer science, information science, in, in fields that can make things too. So I think we're gonna have to figure out, um, I mean, we need the funders to get very serious and put together, I mean, I'm so you know grateful for the KPOR Center. I think they've taken incredible leadership and they're here today. I think Ford has taken a lot of leadership. Um, you know, Omidyar is trying to take some leadership, but real funds in the, in the billions have to be put together and be made available for us to not only make alternatives where we're thinking about things like the environmental impact, and should, can this be made in a way that doesn't destroy the environment, where we're thinking about um, not destroying people's civil and human rights through a product, where we can center the, the cultural and social context of our communities and what they need and work on problems that we really need solved in our communities that are in partnering with, you know, um, with lots of different organizations to do that. To even raise up that paradigm right now is, feels a little bit impossible, quite frankly, because what we don't get are back of the envelope funding, like, you know, we, we don't get funding on a concept of a plan. And, you know, the other part is we, the, the, the scale is just too small. We need a lot of space and money and room to have the, the lab. I mean, I have uh, several colleagues, you know, we are trying to raise up and some of them are in this room, um, a, a research lab where we can do experiments on safe, um, uh, technology development or slowing down of certain kinds of technologies. And we need space not only to do that, and that is real money on the table for lots of people. Some of us, I think, are trusted that we are good vetters. You know, we know the community. We know the community of makers. We know a lot of you in this room who should be resourced and that we can help resource. So we're very committed to, to building those kinds of funds. And uh, you know, we also need space to fail because this is, Silicon Valley is a place where everybody gets to, well, not everybody, white men get to fail up constantly, fail up. And we don't have any space to fail up. So I think we're gonna have to, like that's part of the paradigm shift as well, that we can sit with students from San Jose, from Fresno State, from UCLA, Berkeley, all the places, the community colleges, Sonia Christian, our chancellor of the community colleges, so brilliant, so committed to the people of California, to having a 60-year-old grandma be able to get in on 
solving problems and working on things in her own community and our ability to facilitate these kinds of networks and problem solving. There's so many incredible minds and um, we see the, the, that there's a, um, a lack of will or just a lack of organization right now among people who have real money that could empower these kinds of possibilities. So money doesn't solve everything, but it solves like almost everything. So oh, I it feel helped. like, you know, uh, if I could make the case, I would say we have nothing to lose now. We have four years that we should be tripling down on different kinds of possibilities to emerge. This is really an important moment for that. Well, if I can add just a couple of thoughts here, um, uh, coming back to the public concept. We know um, through the pandemic and a little bit post-pandemic, we talked a little bit about this last night, Charlton, that um, we still have places, mostly identified through redlining, if you draw it all the way back, that still don't fully have the either the internet resources or the access to computers or right. access to the technology. So as everything has accelerated and moved quicker, um, we are at the great risk or run great peril in the general public of leaving people even further behind. So as public universities, I think we have a special responsibility to reach back sooner, to partner with K through 12 to ensure that we know, we know where those places are. We clearly know now through post-pandemic and all of the work that organizations like yours have done to show where the disparities are to put in a, not a red line, but a green line or a green circle around those communities to say we need, we need to lean in and help or we will get further and further behind. In, you're talking about a different type of problem. We're just talking about basic, basic needs, access, and ability to come to a public university so they have a fighting chance mm -hmm. to be successful and to um, close those socioeconomic gaps. And I would just say on the really good point you made on the issue of capital. So to be clear, there isn't enough capital in philanthropy to fill the gaps of the challenges we are talking about. There isn't enough grant money, I should say very clearly, right? So the Ford Foundation around the world gives away $700, $750 million a year. That's a, 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 a teaspoon in the ocean. And any part of the ecosystem we fund, whether it's black feminists on the continent in Africa, or LGBT uh, uh, in Uganda, I mean, whatever it is, that, that population of people rightly believe that they are under-resourced, because they are under-resourced. But the capital of which we need to also uh, clarify that billions and trillions, that's not grant dollars. That's investment dollars. In, in this part of the world, most of the investment dollars goes to founders through venture capital funds, and those founders someday become Mark Zuckerberg uh, or name the, those founders and the companies that invest in those founders have historically excluded black folk, Latinx, women, we know the data. And so part of the role has to be to ask the question, why aren't we funding more founders? I mean, we can't, yes, we need more research and we need to be funding public institutions to do this work and we are under, under resourcing, just to be clear. But the real, transformational capital and, and, and the people who we should be also asking questions of those investment firms is, why aren't you investing in black women or Latinx founders? Where are those founders? Why aren't we seeing more of those founders? There's a whole conversation that needs to be had while we are having this conversation as well because 
unless we are able to get at that market, which, which is when you rightly talk about the extraction that is happening, uh, those companies, those, uh, those entities, many of them started as small ideas and an entrepreneur gets friends and family investors, which we never have because granddaddy didn't get the GI Bill and buy a house and when he died left each of us $200,000 so that we could start a business. We don't, we don't have that. We, we, we were not allowed to experience that. And so now we don't have friends and family and Series A. And so that conversation we need to, and we need to also be engaged in and not seed the question where the real money is to people who, who aren't representative of the perspectives we bring. Charlton, you wrote the book on that, so I feel like you might need to, I, we know and, the answer as to why Sand Hill Road doesn't put the money into our ideas and hasn't for a long time, but I feel like we need to hear from you on this one. We, we know the why, um, and why it doesn't happen. I think the question for me is how do we, you know, you're exactly right, that's where the money that funds the revolution comes from. But what we've also known is that year after year, decade after decade, we've pleaded this case and the VCs continue to not fund us. There we go. <laughs> Just like a fine beverage. Exactly. Uh, I, I, hold it like I you hold your whiskey. I to have one up here. Um, <laughs> So, I, you know, I guess the question is, how do we, what is the case, how do you compel, how do you, you know, we've begged, borrowed, and stolen, but we can't seem to get those same VCs. I'm remembering back just a few years ago, George Floyd, and this community said, we got to do more, we're going to do more, we're pledging to do more, and where is that? None of it materialized, or I should say very little of it materialized. Um, so that, to me, is the question. And I'm going to leave that there, because I know that some of you have questions for these brilliant folks. So we're going to open, uh, open up the floor uh, for a few questions, and then, unfortunately, have to While close you're taking out. questions, I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we have to double down in the efforts that we're doing in K through 8, especially post-pandemic, and, of course, 8 through 12 in math readiness, uh, reading readiness, which we knew already in vulnerable pop populations was, was wiggly. It's not a technical term, but it wasn't going up to where it should be. And it's, it's dropped even further back nationally in certain communities. You can see it even brighter on readiness. So the STEM, the STEM community where some of this um, in, intellect exists will continue to wilt if we don't have that community of learners ready with the right math, science, and reading skills. And that's a while we're waiting on a hand, I haven't seen one yet, so I'm gonna, okay. No, no, go ahead. Uh, but I, I, to your point, which I, I think is a brilliant one, and in some ways controversial. Um, I come from an institution where uh, a fellow leader in times past said to me, this is not our role, right? When people hit the door of their first year of college, that's our responsibility. We don't have a responsibility, and we're not going to commit energy and funds and resources to pull back further into those earlier grades. So I'd love to hear you talk about that really being a hallmark and responsibility of our institutions. I'm aware, and that's why we have equity gaps. Yeah. So you can't catch up if you're never ready to exactly. begin with, right? right? So if you look at the root cause, it is us. It is us that has to reach back and stop the blame of another public sector partner, which is what I was talking about earlier on this intersegmental, we're all connected, but we're not. Mm -hmm. We're divided by these partitions. Indeed. And by the time the input gets to our university, if they're not ready, or any public university, right. 
then they'll never be ready even to take advantage of the opportunities that do exist here. It's not perfect, but there are certainly There's more some. opportunities here than there are in other, other places and other communities. Right. Thank you. All right, hands. Hi. Hello, uh, my name is Eduardo Gonzalez. I work at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on our civil justice project. Um, so I, this kind of community, the public interest community, um, same community of vibe of like doers, we are people-centered and we're trying to give agency to communities. Um, we also struggle in civil justice to get funds for legal aid and for courts, for their digital infrastructure, all of this work. And we are like talking same values. What happens when each of our sectors, so siloed from each other, are asking for the same limited capital with the same values and ideas and our funders have to choose which particular intersecting piece they should go in on? So my question is, how, how do we bring that together and pull across sectors where you know, legal services, working with courts and judges, super beneficial when you're talking about technology for civics also, and there's this complementary nature of these two populations that, I mean, we don't really hang out at conferences all the time, but how do we communicate with funders and our partners to make sure that we are aligned and, and kind of complementarily working towards this future that we're planning for? I'm happy to go uh, first, uh, although you've got probably more experience <laughs> dealing with the downside of this. Uh, no, I think uh, there's no doubt that uh, the system, meaning the system of funding, uh, is dysfunctional. And in some ways, we talk about the rhetoric of collaboration, working intersectionally, but we're not often organized, just like universities. I mean, just as you were describing how that curriculum is tight and getting the humanities and getting uh, what needs to be in that engineering curriculum is really hardened in a system that incents certain behaviors and policies that work against the actual objectives. We can do that too uh, in foundations because we will, like universities, be organized in lanes and say, well, but we're tech. Legal services is over with the civil rights team. And I think part of what we've tried to do, not fully successfully, is, is to organize and incent grant making that does connect the dots. So that's the objective. The challenge is, the, the response often is to basically under-resource everybody, right? Because I've been in conversations at, at, at Ford when I first became president and we were, and I said, we are, we are funding everybody at a subsistence level. And they tell us that. But the alternative is to do the choice making that says, this is more important than that. And, and we have a really hard time doing that. And even when you say, and I, I've had conversations when we say, we are going to do um, an arts program, an, an, an equity arts program, and most of the grants are going to black and brown cultural organizations. And then you get blowback. Why are you funding the elite black and brown organizations? Why are you funding Dance Theater of Harlem? And you should be funding this grassroots urban bushwoman in Bed-Stuy, right? And, and, so, and so you get into this loop where, where you're constantly saying, oh, we did it wrong. And, and I think it makes then institutions revert back, which you have to push against. I'm just, I'm just saying I, I, what you're, you have named the problem accurately, and I'm just giving you a, a view from the inside of, an, of one institution that has struggled with just the issue of equity. Like how do we, if we mean equity, like in that example, you know, is it Dance Theater of Harlem and the Studio Museum and El Palo? Or, because it can't be 20, because we don't have the resources. And so we have to make a choice. 
And even in doing that, it's fraught, and, and institutions just revert to the norm. I would, if I could add just quickly to this, I, I think it's in the public, clearly we have placemaking responsibilities. And what I have found successful in response to the choice-making responsibilities that you defined is at the CEO level to have clarity of purpose of what we're trying to achieve and to bring the partners in that are trying to do that same work, similar to what you described in you know, lawyers and judges and communities, that there is one common agenda that strengthens your ability to get to the top of the list. I call it, you know, make it easy to say yes. Uh, because it's really easy to say no. So we have to find ways to make it easy to say yes. And as publics, I think with a focus on placemaking, there can be some clarity on how you triangulate who the right partners are to get over the finish line. But we have to work hard not to boil the ocean in that those examples to be focused on that and be able to assess and show demonstrable success, et cetera, all the things that all the agencies look for. But does attract? it does attract other funding than when you can do it right. You hope so. You, you hope so. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. And often the organizations that are uh, black, Latinx, brown organizations, women-led or organizations, are often asked to do the work. Yes, be a partner for free. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when I ran a nonprofit in Harlem, the number of times I'd have like a white program officer downtown say, can you come to a meeting and because we're studying this or we're exploring this or we and you say, so you want me to get on the subway and spend two days in a conference room at your foundation while you are whiteboarding. I have an organization to run. And, and, but, and so that process, even that dynamic of partners becomes fraught yeah. if the foundation doesn't realize that these folk, yeah. time is valuable right. to their communities. Right. Well, especially if it's a sham. Well no, well, no, the foundation <laughs> doesn't think it's a sham. The found, I mean, it's a real experience for the foundation. Well, yeah. because Because they, they have nothing to, to lose. They have this great, uh, Unpaid consultants. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, they need to practice cultural humility then. Well, I'll just say one thing. One, one thing that I have loved about, you know, working with Andrine and her leadership in this community is really. Yeah. Can we Every, call out Andrine? Can we give it up yeah. for Andrine? Shout out Andrine. We love us some Andrine. <laughs> we love us some Andrine. One of the things that I love about your leadership with this community is that we understand kind of uniquely what what lane we're in. So for me, I'm at UCLA. I'm at the number one uh, public research university in the country. I don't want to compete with your organization, and I don't want to take resources from what you're trying to do because I have another power base to lean into called UCLA. And so I think part of what is valuable here is our ability to power map ourselves mm -hmm. You know, do we don't exercise that ability to power map, okay, who's where? I mean, we're, we're very good at this at the Center on Race and Digital Justice because we're like, okay, we have UCLA at our back, um, we have different funders, then we're always looking for the grassroots partner and we're sharing in the resource because we know that it will be hard for our community-based partners that we work with, movement organizations in particular, to do their work. and. Um, we understand the power asymmetry because we're always in a power analysis about ourselves. So that is also incumbent upon, I think, the, like the faculty researchers here, people tied to institutions need to understand that because they often don't have a good power analysis about themselves in relationship to community organizations, which is treacherous and unfair. Um, so I think those are the kinds of things that this community and dream that you can help us continue to do so that we are uh, cognizant of the power asymmetries and then we're strategic in working together so that uh, it isn't, you know, resourcing one without the other. I mean, in, in our center, what we try to do is pass through. We re-grant most of the grant money that comes to us, quite frankly. And we support a lot of people with things that a traditional funder actually can't fund. Right. 
they can't fund when you're about to get evicted and you're in the, your fourth year of your PhD program and you're a black trans person and you're in crisis, but you are literally the future. You are one of the most important up and coming scholars. Ford can't solve that. We can solve that. So I think we have to do that kind of creative mapping of our ecosystem so we can be of mutual benefit and service to each other. That's a great point. We're at time. Dang it. OK. Um, I, I rarely like to cede time, but so I'm going to steal just a, a few more seconds. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, Katie came with the well, just I, a I dagger. I got to stop now. <laughs> I guess. Just have to Darren, post it. Thank you for your leadership and investment in this work. Cynthia, thank you for your leadership of this amazing institution. Safia, thank you for your brilliance and your dedication and all the work that you do. Please join me in. Thank you.